A warm, warm welcome to you and to those joining us online for the second evening of the Digital Lectures 2023. For those who may be new to NTC, I'm Lee Jia Wei, a lecturer in Biblical Studies and Global Mission, and also the director of Bridging Worlds, a center for Asian Christianities. This year, we are truly honored to have Dr. Amos Young with us, who serves as a professor of theology and mission and the director of the Inter um, School of Intercultural Studies at Fuller Seminary. Dr. Young is indeed a rare scholar, I think, whose expertise spans a wide range of topics. If you had an opportunity to look through the books on display in our um, foyer, you would have undoubtedly noticed the breadth of his work, which it encompasses areas such as Pentecostal theology, Holy Spirit, global missions and church, Asian Christianity, interfaith dialogue, hospitality, political theology, Bible and disability, and race and church and religious education, to name a few. So many of us, I'm sure, have been touched and enriched by Dr. Young's profound scholarship during our academic journeys. So as we gather for the second lecture this evening, Jesus in Cartographic Perspective, Mapping Christian Practice, Thinking and Feeling After Pentecost. Please join me to welcome Dr. Young to the stage. Thank you so much, and also for the wonderful hospitality shown by you and your husband. Um, and as was being mentioned about some of the books and areas I've published, and I actually thought to myself, I've actually just only written about the Holy Spirit in all of those different books. So it's just really one book, and, which is why I'm working on my second book for these lectures on Christology. And today, we are going to focus, uh, the title tonight is Jesus the Anointed One, Historical Orthopraxic Mappings. And we are going to, I'm glad to see you here and hopefully many others as well that are online. We're going to get into the content of talking about Christology and Christian practice. And we're going to be looking uh, quite a bit at uh, mission practice as well today and we'll unpack some of that as we go. Uh, three parts of my talk will begin with apostolic practice and then shift to uh, if, uh, exemplary mission practice and perhaps not so exemplary mission practice. And we'll sort of see how these Christological images might play out over the course of tonight. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start uh, in our first part by looking at uh, apostolic aspects of uh, the church's practice, and we'll begin by uh, focusing on what I call spirited Jesus. If you were here in chapel this morning, then you will have already heard a little bit of what I have to say, starting with the third gospel, uh, Jesus and Luke as the spirit-empowered Christ. We will start there. Luke, I'll move on to Acts in a moment, and then also come back and take uh, a, a, a more a broader picture about how we might map uh, these different ways in which uh, Christic images uh, uh, impel and compel and uh, under, uh, undergird Christian practice. In the Gospel of Luke, um, we, we know that Luke identifies Jesus as the Messiah, the one who is sent by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus returns full of the Spirit from uh, the desert, and he enters into the synagogue, and he pulls forth the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he reads from there, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year, this year of the Lord's favor. And... Most, uh, most of us would recognize that would be a very good summary, sort of almost Luke's table of contents for the Gospel of Luke. In other words, Jesus announces his public ministry as one that is impelled by the Spirit, and he then goes forth, and we can read uh, for the rest of the Gospel about how he does 
bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. All of that, of course, is set up very nicely in the first three chapters in which we have not only the conception of Jesus by the Spirit, but also a variety of other windows into his messianic identity, including some of which I talked about this morning relative to the birth of, of John the Baptist, again, the Spirit's uh, overshadowing upon that birth, and then the annunciation of the Spirit through Elizabeth, through Zechariah, uh, and then also through Simeon uh, in Acts chapter 2, as well as in a few other places in the first few chapters. So Luke presents us with a Spirit-empowered Christ who uh, uh, does the work of the Father uh, in the power of the Spirit. Jesus then gives the Spirit in the book of Acts. The final chapter of the Gospel of Luke indicates that Jesus told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the power from on high. The promise of that, uh, uh, the fulfillment of that promise is seen in Acts chapter 2, in which the disciples receive the Spirit uh, and the people of Jerusalem as well uh, participate in that initial outpouring of the Spirit in which then that is said to be not only the fulfillment of what is said in Luke 24, but also the fulfillment of the, old, uh, the uh, ancient prophecy of Joel, um, that God in these days, in these uh, days of God's anticipated reign, the day of the Lord would be pouring out God's spirit upon all, as indicated by the references to the 16 people groups that are uh, that are not an exhaustive listing, but are a sample listing, uh, corralled from the 70 nations in the Old Testament, but indicative really as a summary statement in Acts chapter 2 says, uh, there were on the streets of Jerusalem gathered those from every nation under heaven. So the outpouring of the Spirit then uh, of Jesus, the Spirit that was given to Jesus, that pours out the Spirit upon Jesus, is in order to enable, and you shall receive power after the Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. So the same Spirit that anointed the Messianic ministry in the Gospel of Luke is a Spirit that is given to the disciples in the second volume, and it's also then the empowering of the disciples' witness to the risen Christ in the rest of the Gospel of Luke. Acts 1.8, the last part of that phrase of uh, that verse, gives us also then uh, Luke's nice sort of table of contents. Now a bit more sequentially mapped relative to the material in the book of Acts. Starting in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, uh, into Judea, Acts chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, into Samaria, uh, Acts 8, and to the ends of the earth starting after uh, maybe toward the end of Acts 8, you have the Ethiopian eunuch, and until we finally get to Rome, right, uh, in Acts 28, which from a Jerusalem-centered perspective, uh, Acts 1-8 then provides a scheme and a map, if you will, of Christian witness and practice uh, that is spatially organized, uh, organized according to the center, uh, the Jerusalem center, and organized then according to the edges of the known world in which uh, the ends of the earth are exactly where things uh, end up in, in Acts chapter 28. So from, from that perspective, uh, I'd like to spend a few moments to identify then uh, what I hope to do in much of the rest of this talk tonight, attempt to map messianic theopraxis and discipleship. So again, if we uh, draw on the uh, imagery and the metaphor of mapping, particular GPS or the NAVSAT, how do these devices function for us? On the one hand, they provide for us imaginative pathways, imaginative routes to places that we might feel like we want to go, uh, to places that we believe that we uh, might need to uh, arrive at. Uh, if we need to, to get to a hospital, uh, we'll get to that. On the other hand, it might be much more open-ended than that. Uh, maybe we want to take a vacation, uh, and, and that vacation means that we've got oh, oh, a number of different options that we might be able to choose from, 
and maps uh, might help us to choose and zero in and then make the trips that we might want to make. So when you read Acts 1.8, you can see how that kind of uh, description, and you shall receive power after the Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem, into Judea, into Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Uh, you know, to what degree does the text in that case precede the mission? Or to what degree does the text uh, uh, at, uh, emerge as a second order reflection of the consideration of the apostolic journeys up until the time of, again, if we, if we take Luke to have been the author maybe sometime in the 80s or et cetera, 70s or 80s of that time. But that's still a significant time of you know, 40 years or so uh, along the Christian journey. On the other hand, maps can also not just direct, but they can also, what I would suggest, uh, as they can discipline. Maps can constrain uh, how we see things, where we see things, and where we might then direct ourselves to. Uh, for instance, if we need, I'm not sure how useful it is here in the UK, but in the, in the US, there are two things that I might use my GPS for that would include some constraints. For example, I might, I might say avoid traffic jams. That's a very helpful feature of the GPS. I might drive a longer route, uh, go uh, put more miles under my car, but I might get to my des destination quite a bit quicker than if I would have taken the most direct uh, uh, route uh, from point A to point B. Or I might say avoid tolls, uh, depending on whether or not I've got a toll meter that uh, can pay for it electronically, or if I have cash, etc. So there's ways in which our routes can have built-in parameters built-in constraints that might take us in one direction and avoid in other directions. If we're developers, we consult the zoning maps of the regions in which we're seeking to develop. Why? Because uh, we may be able to build apartments in certain places, but we can't build apartments in other places, depending on the zoning constraints or the zoning parameters or guidelines. So maps in these cases all uh, also identify routes not to be taken, or routes overlooked, or routes avoided. I'm imagining, for instance, uh, what uh, the author of Acts describes in the 16th chapter, where uh, there was the first, uh, the second mention of Asia, I'm partial to mentions of Asia in the Bible, and there's a second mention of Asia in the book of Acts where it says that they were constrained uh, not to go in that direction. Right, so then they passed over into, uh, into what we now call Greece. Of course, we know that later on, the time did come about where Paul then landed a few chapters later, according to the layout of Acts, in Ephesus. So it wasn't necessarily a direct route to Asia. It was a very indirect route uh, through which the apostolic mission unfolded in that particular time and space. Um, so seeing how then maps can function to direct but maps can also discipline, they can constrain, uh, they can guide as well. So the question that I would want us to follow for uh, the rest of this evening is the question that's popularized, at least in my country, what would Jesus do? And what are the implications of what Jesus would do? This is the bigger question. I mean, that's the speculative theoretical question, which we can spend time speculating and theorizing about. Probably the deeper, more important question behind that question is, what would we do? Or what should we do? The abstract question of what would Jesus do, there's not too much at stake. But when the question concerns, well, what ought we to do in this time and in this space? Then that's really when the question of what would Jesus do take on significance. Uh, for my tradition and again for what uh, we're doing, it's the similar question or the parallel question is, what would the apostles do? It's not quite as catchy as what would Jesus do, but it, it, it sounds the same kind of question to what's really at stake. In the first letter to Peter, uh, this is said, uh, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example 
so that you should follow in his steps. So for us as disciples, uh, I believe that we are all invested in what would Jesus do, not just for historical curiosity's sake, but for the sake of, again, what I would call Christian practice, for the sake of Christian discipleship, and for the sake of Christian mission. And from that perspective, uh, let us look at some, again, what I would call now in this next part of our talk, uh, some more exemplary expressions of Christian witness, and then we will end this evening with some more questionable uh, expressions of Christian witness. As we now start the second part of um, my talk tonight, um, I'm going to more often than not use the language of Christian witness to talk about these more exemplary expressions. The uh, established uh, language and, and nomenclature for that in the uh, area of theological and missiological studies is Christian mission. I think as we all know, that language of mission uh, has, there have been lots of questions raised about that language of mission uh, more recently over the last, let's say, 20, 30, 40 years. I believe that language um, is redeemable, and, but yet we are going to have to do hard work at it. Part of my way of going about redeeming that language is to continue to provide also what I would say would be at least synonyms, but perhaps also replacements that will allow us to continue to retrieve and reappropriate language of mission without necessarily being wedded to that language. Now, that, that conversation is complex and we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time. This is not a missiology, it's a Christology, but I just wanted to at least name that uh, we're gonna be talking missiology this, this evening uh, but yet, I also want to invite us to think in terms of the language of witness as we think missiologically in this particular context. In the next few moments, I want to lift up uh, uh, three aspects or three sites of Christian witness that I believe remain exemplary and that I re believe remain uh, full of potential and also full of uh, actual uh, benefit for, for the church and for our work even today, even though these are historic sites, I would call them liturgical witness, monastic witness, and then my own language is what I call struggling witness. So we'll sort of unpack that uh, in, a few, in a few moments. For uh, language of liturgical witness, I want to begin with the image of uh, fellowship with Jesus in which we share um, uh, with, with, with one another, uh, usually around a table. So I want to begin by talking about uh, Eucharistic sharing or the eating together that we do, which is always situated, whether around tables or on floors, but in space and uh, not just in time, but in space. Right? So we begin certainly and go back to the apostolic testimony and all in the... In the um, at the end of, the, of Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, all came upon everyone because many signs and wonders were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent time, much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and new, generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people and day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. <clears throat> so the beginning of this is just simply table fellowship. Table fellowship that was not devoid of, if you will, um, a missional element or a witnessing element. Day by day, the community responded, not just to the table fellowship, but to what that table fellowship represented amidst that wider, emerging, new apostolic communal experience, which shifted locales from the breaking of bread at home to the worship time in the temple, the generosity of hearts at home and the worshipful hearts in the temple. There was a mutual sharing, including of the food that they ate, the bread that they broke. So we have the eating that happens with Jesus and Luke, and then the eating of Jesus' body in Acts, uh, 
And that unfolds also then into what later Christian traditions call the Eucharist, the eating of Jesus himself, so to speak, of his body and of his blood. And that Eucharistic witness in those cases continues to exist within a broader uh, ecosystem, which we call the liturgy. So that the Eucharist becomes part of the invocation of the presence of Christ that begins also with the call to prayer, that begins also with the call to worship, and that continues in uh, the variety of things that the gathered people of God do together. What happens in the Eucharist is also consistent with and, and connected to invocations of Christ uh, and the Father and the Spirit, for example, in baptism. Uh, baptism in water. And that invocation involves, at that point in time, also uh, exorcisms, the renouncings of evil spirits and the devil. And so we see that within this liturgical ecosystem, within this uh, initiatory and then liturgical reality, that Jesus is present in invocation, Jesus is present sacramentally, in our being baptized with him, and then in our uh, uh, taking and consuming, if you will, uh, who he is. And out of this Christian practice uh, continues to grow this body of Christ and continues to grow this church. We, I would uh, suggest also see that uh, by the time the fourth century comes about, Trinitarian Confession, which we'll come back to tomorrow and look at Nicaea a bit, um, emerges, therefore, as a second-order uh, reflection from out of this now uh, centuries-long practice of baptism, of Eucharist, of prayers, of worship, so that Father, Son, and Spirit uh, now have been uh, inhabited and participated in liturgically, including then the initiation of new ones into these liturgies and into these mysteries, so to speak. I want to close this part by saying a few words about uh, the paradigm of the missiological paradigm, particularly in the Eastern Orthodox communion, in which at the center of it is uh, called mission as the liturgy after the liturgy. So some of you might have heard of that phrasing. The liturgy in this case, and it's, uh, this is not necessarily now only belonging to the Orthodox communion, but it also means simply works of service, and these works of service exist within this worshiping community, and this worshiping community exists in spaces and locations that are rubbing shoulders with broader communities. So the liturgy, uh, mission as the liturgy after the liturgy, means that there is this sacramental and liturgical experience of the living Christ that then is shared with the surrounding community. The liturgy in this particular imaginative and missiological uh, frame provides both the motivation, as evidenced by its prayers for the world. It provides the methodology, as evidenced by the proclamation of the gospel uh, in the sermon and in the Eucharist. And it provides the aim of mission that draws the community into the life of uh, the liturgical life of the church. So in that respect, it's a liturgy after the liturgy, uh, and they are distinctive and certainly uh, you know, not wanting to, to simply break this down completely so that there is a no end to the liturgy, but there is certainly the understanding that the liturgy is a missiological uh, enactment or performance in which the broader community is welcome to participate in and then invited and then initiated into as the response is there. Um, I think consistent with uh, the way in which we might see how Acts 2.47 talks about it relative to doing the work of uh, breaking bread together, doing the, the work of worshiping together, uh, doing the work of sharing from home to home, uh, participating together as a worshiping community, and day by day, the Lord added to them those who would be saved. 
I want to take a couple moments and look a little bit further also at uh, what I'm calling monastic Jesus, in which we have the uh, missiological work of a monastic community in particular on behalf of or for the sake of the world. Now, certainly, uh, especially within Byzantine traditions, this, uh, what we ended up in a few, a few moments ago in terms of the an orthodox understanding of, of mission would be very consistent with at least some of the, the Byzantine and, and related uh, monastic communal uh, uh, practices, right? But going back into the history, early history of Christianity, by the fourth century, we have individuals like Athanasius uh, writing uh, treatises like the life of Anthony, which then provide us now with, uh, for the first time, sort of maps of uh, the, the Eremitic life, the Eremitic solitaries who were compelled to go into the desert following in the footsteps of Jesus. Uh, in the uh, later fourth and into the fifth centuries, whether it's Pacomius or Augustine or Cassian, gradual Cenobitic communities uh, or groups of those, these solitaries would begin to come together and they would begin to form uh, communal ways of life. Benedict's rule emerges in about the fifth or sixth century as well. Uh, St. Benedict, as we know, was a leader of one of these monastic communities and the rule itself provides us with uh, a vision of what Christian discipleship, Christian practice, and Christian witness look like uh, within these uh, monastic communities, replicated in a variety of ways now across space and time. Uh, uh, groups of monks on the one hand, there were some groups of nuns convents on the other hand, later on in the medieval period, certainly. And the Benedictine rule uh, led also to a Benedictine spirituality that was missiological as well. The rule invited the community into uh, experiencing the, the, the God's mystery manifest in Jesus Christ and that experience took place within different monastic spaces. So when we read through the 73 chapters of the rule, we see how there are rhythms that uh, modulate what happens across the day, but I'm more interested uh, in how those rhythms are spatially uh, connected. Getting up in the morning in, uh, from bed, there, there are rules for, for help us to, to do that. Going into times of prayer in chapels, there's rules to help us to organize ourselves and uh, uh, situate our bodies in certain ways. Going into the kitchen for meal times, there are rules that, that shape the ways in which we eat, to, eat together, we prepare food together. Going then from there to um, the labor, the arenas of labor for five hours a day in which uh, monks were expected to do the work of the monastery or as that expanded over into the broader community. Going into the infirmary where sick bodies were attended to. In other words, we can read the rule for the rhythms that they exhibit, and those are also helpful, but we can also read the rules as ways in which bodies are expected to inhabit spaces and relate to other bodies in those spaces. Chapter four of the Benedictine rule is about being an instrument of good works. Uh, the chapter includes a variety of discussions. There are actually 73 aspects of instruments of good works that are un, uh, detailed in the fourth chapter of the rule. It, amongst them includes what it means to love God and neighbor, attend to the Ten Commandments with regard to one's relationship with neighbors, to relieve the poor, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick, to help with the sick, to console the, suffer, uh, the sorrowing, to love one's enemies, uh, to obey God and thus be, quote, sweet to others. A rule advocates also all kinds of invitations to welcome guests, to be hospitable to visitors to the community, 
These are outsiders, obviously, right? Um, some would be friends. Some would be others that would be passing along the monastic way. But otherwise, it's also travelers, just guests, members from outside the community. Christ pervades the rule from the prologue to the final chapter, but all of it provides a way of being in space and time for the sake of the community, which includes the wider community within which these monasteries are embedded. And so there are ways in which we can understand Benedictine spirituality as a spirituality not just of uh, temporal deeds, but of geographical emb uh, embeddedness. How do we live out the mission of God in the various spaces uh, that we find ourselves in or that we choose to inhabit? I want to um, now close this second part of uh, our talk tonight by identifying, I think, what are, from the Acts material, what has also provided, I think, a pretty solid uh, map for what I call um, Christian witness at its spirit-enabled, struggling best. Now, what, I, what do I put it that way? So I come from a Pentecostal community in which spirit being filled with the spirit uh, oftentimes is understood in relationship to more spectacular expressions or manifestations of uh, how the spirit's work is presumed to unfold. Signs and wonders, miracles, and miraculous healings, especially of the body, large growth, uh, you know, uh, various places throughout the Acts of the Apostles, it said, and all Asia heard the word of the Lord and rejoiced. You know, these wonderfully, spectacularly, everybody got saved kind of language, right? And we all say, hallelujah, praise God, let that happen in my church. And every once in a while, you'll have a church that maybe we can say kind of, you know, participates in that kind of, you know, and, and the whole world came to know and, and so on. But yet, Acts 1.8 uh, suggests that, uh, and you shall be my witnesses, my martyrs. So, being spirit-filled can also be understood as, if you will, in a more modest way, just being enabled for the struggle. And there are many other ways to read through the book of Acts in which we can find that that enablement for the struggle is actually more the dominant through line of Christian practice. We obviously, are, are, our attention gravitates more to, you know, when Peter's shadow, uh, uh, you know, uh, healed those who were sick. Lord, may that happen to my ministry. Um, more often than not, we find that, uh, well, Paul got thrown in jail, and we know of, you know, I, I, there was a brother this morning in the group that I was in talking about persecution going on in Northeast India now, in which there have been literally hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of Christians that have been persecuted and many killed uh, in the last few months. That's more like the story of what happens, not just with regard to Stephen and, and um, uh, John, uh, is, it, is it the guy in chapter 12? James, <laughs> right? And, and of course, you know, Paul's route to Rome goes through incarceration. Uh, he, you know, Paul doesn't say he wants to get to Rome until Acts 19. So we don't know where along the way Paul decided he needed to get to Rome, but Luke already tells us that we're going to get to Rome at some point in Acts 1.8. And so he's got to make it happen somehow. Well, we'll find a way to get there by at least, you know, getting him hauled off uh, by, the, by Caesar's guards and so on, right? Um, so I think the point would be that, that spirit-enabled struggling is actually more like the story of the the acts of the Holy Spirit. Um, more often than not, it's, you know, the unnamed. Uh, Paul's nephew. Well, who in the world was he? We don't know. Philip's four evangelist daughters. Uh, what were their names? We don't know. And so many others. And, and particularly so many others across space and time. 
also enabled by the same Spirit, bearing witness. Eh, not triumphant witness, but struggling witness. Uh, the kind of witness that attends to the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, and those in prison. The very physically rooted, real witness. When was I ministering to you? I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took me in. I was in prison and you visited me. The names of those who have been in prison or hungry or naked, I mean, they're, they're not the names that have made the headlines over the last 2,000 years. And the folks that have visited them or fed them or clothed them, those names will. But in those moments and spaces in which the naked were clothed and the hungry were fed and those incarcerated were visited was when Jesus was visited and when Jesus showed up for the salvation of the visitor. You are part of the sheep because you attended to me when I was. You are invited to everlasting life by the Father because you attended to me when I was. Gee, the, the people that showed up in prison thought they were being bearing witness to the risen Christ to those who were in prison, and yet it was their attending to the prisoner that was itself what allowed them to be named in the Lamb's Book of Life. So for, theirs, for those names that have been lost, Dust to dust, ashes to ashes, spirit enablement goes into the ground at some point, and then resurrection happens, and the Lamb's Book of Life is open, and there we find the names, the names of those who were faithful from Jerusalem into Judea, into Samaria, and into the ends of the earth, doing just the needed thing, giving a cup of water, clothing the naked, Visiting those in prison. <clears throat> and so th that would be how, again, I would say that these windows uh, into the way in which we have shared together, broken bread together, worshipped together, uh, lived life in community together, and then attended to the needs around us together the needs in the spaces that, are, uh, that we inhabit and that are around us. These are the ways in which we follow in Jesus' footsteps by the Spirit's enablement to bear witness to the risen Christ. In this last part of uh, my talk tonight, I want now to turn my attention, I want to turn our attention to what I would call uh, less exemplary missionary Christologies. Uh, what are some of the ways in which images of Jesus have undergirded territorial conquest, economic exploitation, and cultural imperialism? Now, that's not a text taken from a theological work. It's a text taken from a cartographical study of how maps have also been used for precisely those purposes. And so I'm going to use the language of mission for much of now this last few moments of our talk tonight, um, in part also to problematize uh, the at least colonial missiological paradigms that many of us have inherited, that many of us still work within in some or other respect, uh, that many of us seek to rehabilitate, uh, and in many cases, some of us might feel like we might need to start afresh. Uh, let's see how we have created Christological constructs and maps that have guided us against the pagans, against Muslims, and the others uh, around the world. So the first set of, um, again, again, what I call less exemplary Christologies are, I want to uh, summarize them under the ca category of the warrior Jesus in which uh, we might have Christologies for kings, Christologies for rulers, okay? 
Now, much of the New Testament, I think we realize, was written from the vantage point of the apostolic community uh, under the shadow of Rome. Uh, Luke and Acts themselves were written in the days of Tiberius and Augustus Caesar. So we know that Luke writes his narrative fully aware of the imperial dynamics of how he's going to tell the Jesus story as well as the story of the apostolic community. And if we read closely enough, I think we're, we, we are now in much better positions to identify the imperial dimensions of the first century world and how then the apostolic community and experiences, its practices can be understood and appreciated amidst those developments. It is, however, as we all recognize, um, even as soon as after the fourth century, when Christians were no longer on the margins or on the underside of uh, society, but with Constantine in particular, um, become those who have access to political and social uh, and economic power. Eusebius is, of course, the apologist who writes the life of Constantine as a hagiography. And of course, he tells us in about two-thirds of the way through his story about how Constantine, when he is praying, sees a vision of the cross in the heavens, bearing the inscription, conquer by this. Christ himself appears and commends him to make a likeness of the sign which he has seen in the heavens and to use it as a safeguard in all engagements with his enemies. And that's what he proceeds to do. And Eusebius then records how following these, uh, Constantine being obedient to this vision, uh, taking up Christ at his word, fights the hard battles, and then wins entry into Rome, and he ends his uh, uh, life of Constantine with the erection of Constantine's statue. What is important about this narrative is how uh, historians recognize what was most significant in the events of, of what happened with Constantine's life as accounted by Eusebius was the identification of Almighty God whom Christians worship with support of the imperial army. And so we'll see this Constantinian image or this con uh, warrior Christology uh, in Constantine's story continue to unfold as we go on over time. I want to come more particularly to see, to see how it's very, it's, this image uh, comes back again uh, in the Crusades. But before, before I get to that specific replay of the image in at least the Second Crusades, a Second Crusade, I want to look at the emergence of the First Crusades against the backdrop of what I call Pilgrim Christologies. Pilgrim Christologies uh, developing again as uh, Christians not only from what we call the West or, or what we call Europe, but again, all in the ancient world, had begun to appreciate uh, the centrality of Jerusalem. Again, Acts 1-8 that, that centralizes Jerusalem in the, in the Christian salvation history continues to play an important, uh, if you will, geographic uh, imaginary for the Christian community. And so that's where uh, Jesus lived, that's where he died, that's where he was buried, that's where he rose again. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre marks, therefore, that resurrection site. And of course, Jesus' life uh, over the centuries develops all kinds of additional aspects that were congenial to Christian piety rooted in uh, material embodied understandings of ways in which created things, material things, bore spiritual significance. We, call now the, we, call, we now call them relics. Along the way, of course, saints would emerge, and, and the saints inevitably were those who manifest or express in their lives uh, images of Jesus. And so uh, as we visited the, the sites of the saints, that would always spur on another visit toward the real image, the image of Jesus that was uh, Jerusalem-centered or based. And in that respect, then, we have how uh, in the Christian imaginary going into the medieval period, uh, a map of the world with Jerusalem at the center. Uh, for instance, with the Holy Sepul Sepulchre as located in the center of the world, where salvation now radiates from there to the periphery. Uh, this uh, concrete concept uh, had Jerusalem as the navel of the compass of the world, and it influenced, for example, ways in which uh, medievalists mapped the whole world, cartographically and otherwise. And so 
up until now, until the 12th century, there are maps in which Jerusalem is at the center. And the whole point, if you get a chance at some point during your life, was to make the pilgrimage, right? Experience the relics, demonstrate piety, be uh, renewed in your spirit, in your spiritual journey by, being, by connecting to the holiness of what is represented by uh, Jerusalem. So by, uh, you know, in the last uh, few uh, hundred years after the uh, expansion of Islam in the 6th and 7th and 8th centuries, access to Jerusalem became more and more complicated. At the turn of the millennium, then by that time, um, pilgr Christian pilgrimage to Jerusalem was impossible. That was part of what led to the first crusade, right? was against the Muslims uh, to free Jerusalem from uh, Muslim control in order to restore and to reopen up possibility for a Christian pilgrimage in that particular direction. And the Pope, uh, early, earlier versions of what we would call indulgences, but, but uh, penance could be done for those who would undertake these pilgrimages. So penance was always associated with pilgrimages was part of the spirituality that was being expressed. And in this case, the Pope uh, in 1096 made the very clear offering that those who undertake this, this mission to free Jerusalem uh, would uh, earn greater absolutions for their sins. And so in that respect, we have a, a pilgrimage uh, mentality that focuses upon Jerusalem and focus on getting back to Jerusalem, so to speak, in the Christian imagination. I want to close just this part of the worry of Jesus by then talking about Jesus with a sword, how uh, there then emerged over the course of the Crusades what we might call a Christology for Crusaders. Uh, after the First Crusade a reopened p Christian pilgrimage, the Seljuk Turks in about uh, 1130s, 1140, recaptured part of what we would now call Turkey, Constantinople included, city of Edessa in particular, which made the pilgrimage, while Jerusalem was still under the hands of Christians, it made pilgrimage from the west to Jerusalem so much more complicated. By that time, uh, we had different uh, orders of uh, monastic groups that also were sword bearers, including the Knights Templar, starting about, about the 1120s, 1130s. St. Bernard, who I want to spend some more time on on Thursday, but I'm going to take a few moments here to discuss his work, particularly in uh, a document called In Praise of the New Knighthood, in which uh, it also amounted to be a charter for the Knights Templar group, including in letters that he wrote in 1144 to 1146, as the Pope now called for a second crusade to clear the pathway uh, for, through Constantinople to allow pilgrimage to continue to get to where it needed to go in Jerusalem. And Bernard picks up very, very clearly from a Constantinian theme that we heard about a few moments ago. He said uh, in one of his letters um, that uh, crusaders should be furnished with the sign of the Holy Cross and armed against the enemies of the cross of Christ who are on the other side of the Albi. I prohibit for any reason that a treaty be made with them, neither for money nor for tribute, until, with the help of God, they go through the ritual of conversion or the race is wiped out. So that's in one of Bernard's letters in which, again, the appeal to the sign of the cross that we had seen already now almost uh, a thousand years before in Constantine. But it's an appeal then to um, engage with whatever is needed with the infidels in order to convert them or to murder them, to kill them. He says very clearly, for instance, in now, in, in praise of new knighthood, certainly the pagans do not have to be killed if another way is able to stop them from treating the faithful in a hostile or oppressive way. However, now it is good to kill them rather than to abandon the righteous to the certain destiny of the rod of sinners so that by chance the righteous extend their hand to iniquity. In other words, in order to free the Christians who are under the yoke of the Turks, in this case, the Muslims, um, we have to 
get rid of the Muslims, the Turks. Yeah, he also says, again, okay, in, in praise of New United, uh, now that they have begun to do violence to us, it is proper for those who do, it is proper for it is proper for those who do not carry the sword in vain to repel them. So, so use these weapons that have been given uh, in these cases. So we we can see how you know Christology for Crusaders was very literally sort of expressed and carried out uh, in the Second Crusade starting in 1146. Um, Jerusalem finally is uh, retaken by the Muslims in about the seven, 1170s or 1180s. Crusades continue, you know, depending on how, how you count. They may have been six or seven or eight. Uh, and again, over time, the Crusades that might have begun from maybe a bit more uh, spiritually galvanized and motivations uh, over the course of those two or 300 years certainly had been... Uh, uh, Dominated, became dominated by more economic uh, and, and related kinds of political aspirations rather than the spiritual. Okay, now take a deep breath because uh, that's a lot of heavy material of the ways in which Christological images uh, motivated certain kinds of practices that we would not want to say are exemplary miss, miss, missiological practices. Because as we take a deep breath, I, uh, there's some... Also, similarly, if not more challenging terrain that I, I do want to cover, I want to cover that under this notion of the civilizing Jesus, in which we have imperial Christologies that guide also ways in which we engage with uh, worlds, quote-unquote new world. Now, this, the world's always been here, right? <laughs> it's not new to the folks that were living here. It was new to the folks that were looking for something else. Uh, maps to new worlds, then maps for new worlds, right, generated by, by uh, the colonizers. And then I want to close this section with uh, some more contemporary ways in which maps are used. So from the Crusades, we have what we, what we might call, you know, apocalyptic images uh, really grew in the popular imagination across, starting in the late 9th, and the 10th, 11th, 12th, and high Middle, high middle Ages, uh, many of uh, the Book of Revelations uh, paintings uh, emerged over this time that are preserved. And um, these were apocalyptic times, right? The Crusades, if you will. And these apocalyptic images were fueled by uh, apocalyptic uh, materials in the apocalypse, particularly about Jesus. So it's one thing when you're John in the Isle of Patmos writing about the revelation of Jesus as uh, the suffering, uh, the slain lamb and the lion of the tribe of Judah uh, in which, if you will, um, Rome is Babylon of, of Revelation 17 and 18. But it's another thing when you're not John stuck in the Isle of Patmos and you're reading Revelation and you have the swords in your hand, right? Then all of a sudden, King Jesus, warrior Jesus, lion Jesus becomes much more attractive and, and, and it's used to justify how we go about doing what we need to do. Columbus, it is well known, had his own apocalyptic Christology that for him would allow him to allow us to find another route to Jerusalem. It's still back to Jerusalem almost 500 years later. Uh, find another route to Jerusalem to spread the gospel so that all of the Gentiles can be brought in and then the end will come, right? Matthew 24. And he was looking for a route to Jerusalem and he thought when he arrived uh, in the, what we now call the West Indies, he thought he'd arrived at India, not too far from there. I mean, the map that he was working under led him to believe that he was on that particular pathway. So we can see how the eschatological Jesus uh, gave fuel to not just Columbus, but many others in the late 15th century and early 16th century to make these trips that were exploratory, that, that followed the known mappings of the world related to the eschatological images and understandings of the church in, the, in that period of time that uh, uh, enabled them to do the work that they did, did to quote-unquote make these make these quote-unquote discoveries. Um, 
And once we, of course, then have not just the new world, but again, these other parts of the world, the, you know, Africa, what we now call Asia, the Americas. I, I want to use the language of white and European Jesus to highlight both how these images of Jesus were part of broader mappings of the world and of humanity that on the one hand uh, were contrast to those who were not white in the case of the white Europeans. Those who were not white were also through a variety of other ways. Not, so I'm not saying that Christology was the only ways in which these were justified, right? But I'm saying that the Christological mappings uh, work within a broader scheme of maps, uh, hierarchically organized ones, uh, organized in coloreds, right? Uh, or, or not so much in color, in which uh, the white Jesus allowed for an understanding of white Europeans over, let's say, Africans, black Africans. The curse of Canaan, over the few hundred years before the 15th and 16th century became the curse of Ham and applied to then also the understanding of what uh, Jesus and the saved were in relationship to uh, the lost or in relationship also to other peoples of the world. The European Jesus highlighted not just the color of the skin that made a difference for uh, justifying African slavery, but highlighted also the cultural dynamics of the colonizers that allowed them to engage with all the non-Europeans. The pretext to civilize or to bring salvation, bring the light of Jesus to them, that was the pretext, but also amidst that, and, and not to take away from those who may have had real in, good intentions to bring the good news to the rest of the world, right? But that news was brought amidst the, the armada or the, uh, uh, alongside with the trappings of the entire crown. In fact, in 1511, the capitulationes of the, of the imperial edict uh, basically took the rights of um, uh, the papal authority to evangelize and absorb them within the crown. So in other words, it wasn't just the, the priests that had the authority to evangelize, but the crown, the state, the, uh, uh, the colonizers were the ones who had the authority to evangelize, right? So what happens when we, we, we take the logic that we saw in Bernard, where, and this goes back also again back to Constantine, the infidels are those who needed to be engaged and resisted. How do we identify who the infidels are? The infidels are those who reject the gospel. So if they're going to reject, if, if they're infidels by, if the definition of being an infidel is that you reject the gospel, then how do we identify infidels? Well, we make sure the gospel is proclaimed to them. And if they don't accept it, then they're infidels. Well, what happens when you proclaim the gospel in Portuguese or in Spanish to the quote-unquote natives and then you say, do you want to accept Jesus? Of course, in Spanish or in Portuguese. And the infidels look at you and shrug or say yes, but don't know that they're saying yes or say no, right? So defining and making infidels was fairly easy, given the assumptions of language and the ways in which these mechanisms created classes of people that then allowed for the des their designation, and yes, now given that they're infidels, they've rejected the good news, then that justifies putting them into you know, what were called encomiendas for instruction that preceded later on what we did with Native American communities in terms of taking children, putting them in, if you will, Christian schools. And of course, we know the story of what happened in the Americas, uh, given the disease and given a lot of the other developments over the next few hundred years, in which these images of white and European Jesus had very drastic and negative effects, missional effects, on the bodies of peoples of color, black and brown in particular, in the new and also uh, around the world otherwise. Now I want to close this portion um, with uh, a slight twist of uh, in which I'm 
talking about territorializing Jesus and how we've been, we also have been using some maps of um, the modern world as part of this legacy, part of this heritage. These are primarily American versions of Jesus understood in terms of spiritual warfare and related kinds of mappings that are being done. So I would say that if we go back over the last now, probably since about the 70s or 80s, um, think about, uh, maybe this is particularly in, in America, but also now with its different iterations in other parts of the world, particularly given Pentecostal charismatic communities, notions of territoriality, how these territorialities uh, are, are, are connected to and rooted in existing spiritual strongholds is some of the language that's used. So there are geographic ways of organizing the world in which the enemies of the faith uh, the, or the enemies of the gospel or the promoters of sin, so to speak. Sin defined in a variety of ways, uh, usually according to social ills, usually according to the ways in which racial and ethnic hierarchies remain in place in a variety of places, usually according to ways in which immigration patterns bring uh, people of other faiths or people of no faiths or people of strange faiths into proximity with uh, established, generally speaking, white Christian communities, organized in ways in which uh, spaces and places are recognized to be inhabited by those who are of certain sexual orientations or uh, uh, sexual identities or sexual, uh, uh, sexualized communities, organized in ways in which peoples of color map onto um, rates of criminality or certain kinds of criminality, uh, ways in which laws have been used to uh, criminalize certain groupings in disproportionate ways. So now you have strongholds of sexuality, strongholds of crime, strongholds of uh, immigrant communities that are mapped onto different places, right? And, and certain communities then approach these geographies armed with these mapped ways of understanding missionally what's going on and how to engage these communities in these ways. Now, other ways of missiological mapping include, and, and these are not as drastic as the one I've just described, but it would include um, unreached people maps that have been developed particularly since Lausanne 74 for a good number of years, a uh, couple decades, in which ways in which unreached people maps galvanize and motivated Christian mission endeavors to people groupings, language groupings, uh, and so on across the world. Uh, last point on this front, um, think about language of the 1040 window, right? 1040 window provides us with a missiological map for understanding how Christians should strategically engage with Islamic countries, Islamic regions of the world, uh, Islamic states, Muslim communities. So these ways of organizing, naming, uh, uh, partitioning uh, uh, have, have remained influential in guiding what I consider to be our missiological imagination for good or for ill. So I want to now uh, exhale a bit and close quickly. How do we now map Christian witness to and from the ends of the earth in a redemptive way? Right? So I, I've given us a few what I would call, I still think, viable um, uh, Christic imaginative missiolo missiologies that we talked about, you know, liturgically, uh, struggling witness, uh, liturgical witness, monastic witness, and so on. But how do we redeem our missiological Christologies? Um, I, in, I want to introduce also here what I call a parallel uh, uh, cartographic sort of uh, resource. Radical cartography is a project that is, again, this is a cartographic project. It's not religious, it's not theological, but the goal of the radical cartography project is making invisible through mapping those who are traditionally made invisible by mapping. So if you think about the way in which they, this, this way of thinking works, right? So radical cartographers will want to say, Okay, when we're mapping new communities, let's map the challenges as well as the glory. So when we're mapping communities, let's also map, let's say, 
Where does the garbage sites show up in? What happens to our waste? Can we observe where waste gets deposited and then see how those communities where waste is deposited are affected by waste management, waste disposal? Okay? So, so those are finding ways to lift up how communities are impacted negatively by late modern capitalism and the way in which we dispose of our waste, for instance. Um, radical cartographers would want to map refugee and asylum and displacement treks and populations and movements. Why? In order to call attention to their efforts. Radical cartographers would want for maps to actually indicate what happens in the lives of people and what's important for those people of which maps are produced. Why are maps produced of communities that only invite us to, uh, to, you know, to be tourists in these spaces rather than to experience what exactly uh, their perspectives are, what their challenges are, uh, what their experiences are, okay? So, you know, touristing, being tourists is a nice thing. We can go home and our, you know, we're, uh, we've had a good time. We haven't been exposed to too much of the challenges, right? Whereas there are real people in real spaces everywhere, and radical cartographers want to lift up what has happened uh, amongst the people that live in those spaces. So let's go back, and you know we can again. Uh, Bartolome de las Casas is not perfect. He's not a saint. Um, um, you know his Christology did not lead him to denounce slavery as strongly as we might have all hoped. So, you know, he, he didn't come all the way. But for a person of the 15th century who uh, uh, oversaw an encomienda for a few years, who began to see the lives of Indians, he began to see, for instance, that um, these Native Americans are able to love even us, the colonizers, in ways that showed him that they were responding to God's command to love your neighbor more than yourself in ways that he felt like the Spaniards were not able to do for the Native Americans. That led him to revise his anthropology, to begin to then see also, on virtue of the evidence, that the violence that we were committing against Indians was actually not carrying out appropriately God's invitation to love our neighbors ourselves. We were also falsely deploying Christological or theological categories to infidelize these people, right? When, when they are human beings, just like who we are. He began to make arguments on biblical and theological grounds for the human, full humanity against Aristotelian and other ways of justifying these as of a lower level. And so Las Casas would then, therefore, revise laws and begin to situate himself with uh, the people. Because why? He attended to, he had observed, he had listened to. Now he was able to provide an account of who they were. Now, of course, more and more, 500 years later, we have Native American theologians and Native American voices that are Providing, again, deeper, more richer, and thicker accounts. But I'm, I'm going back to this early 15th century source uh, to show us uh, one of the origins of what in the Latinx tradition is Christ outside the gate, right? The gate that was kept by uh, the colonial gatekeepers. How was the experience of the people? And, and, and how, therefore, is redeeming their voices allow us to also envision and understand and follow Christ differently. Uh, the last example I want to give of redeeming Christological, uh, missiological Christologies comes from Laman Sane's work, uh, particularly translating the message, the missionary impact on culture. Some of you might be familiar with it. Sane, I think, does a wonderful job of uh, detailing how uh, a lot of what happened, while, while not making full justification for, for anything about the, the full colonial missionary enterprise, yet, one of the things that the missionaries did try to do was to translate scripture into the languages of the peoples. 
in a lot of those cases, these translation projects ended up salvaging languages that otherwise might have been lost. In a lot of these cases, um, therefore, it's not just that the Bible was the result of the translator project, but that the, uh, those who were working on the translations became actually converted in the process, right? When you learn the language of the other, you enter into another world. You are now effectively, I'll use this term, born again in another language. And by virtue also of retaining and, and if you will, retrieving the languages that may have been otherwise lost. Um, therefore, we have given opportunity once again for the many tongues of Pentecost to be spoken. I wonder and imagine, you know, um, uh, to what degree do we understand ancient first century Phrygian? It's one of the regions mentioned in Acts 2, right? Pamphylians, did they, what kind of language do they speak besides Greek, right? In other words, how many indigenous languages over space uh, and time have been lost? Uh, to what degree can some of these languages continue to be redeemed? As they are, they may indeed declare the wondrous works of God, and they may indeed inspire new and relevant forms of Christian practice. Thank you. Once again, thanks so much for your thought-provoking lecture tonight. I think we have about a bit less than five minutes. So if you are here in person and have a question, I'll just probably invite you to come forward and share your question. And if you are joining us online this evening, please feel free to write your questions so that the questions are being read out, out loud. Any questions? Yes, Steve. Uh, thanks for your paper, Amos. Um, I'll try and sharpen this into a question. I have a smattering of thoughts which try and get me there. Um, one of the ways that maps seem to work is by abstracting from the landscape. And so last night you made a comparison between first and second order discourse. Um, if we think of maps kind of operating at the se second order level, one of the ways that we engage with maps successfully is by having a certain kind of critical skepticism about what the map is doing. So there's a great episode of The Office in which Michael Scott drives his car into a lake because he thinks his GPS is telling him that's the way he needs to drive. So what's happened there is a failure to critically disengage from what the map is telling him about the world. So maps work when we allow the landscape that we encounter to correct what the map has told us about the world. When we're talking about orthopraxy and the question of mapping, are the negative forms of orthopraxy here manifestations just of poor mapping or also of poor map interpretation and an inability to let the landscape correct what the map has said? Amen and amen, and probably a few other aspects of that, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, there, those are some of the ways, I think, I think in which those, these, they work. The, the question of, you know, why or how is always a multi-layered and complicated one, right? Um, on the one hand, they're poor, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're a result of human sin, right? Uh, result of human fallibility, result of human finitude, result of human ignorance. I want to talk a bit more about ignorance tomorrow and, and mappings in relationship to knowledge and, and ignorance. Um, so there's probably no one, yeah, for these kinds of things, there's no one reason why we can say that this is exactly the way it is. Uh, and in that respect as well, uh, you know, the blame is never only on the Christology. It's the Christology amidst and in working with all of these various factors as well, right? Um, so we can use these ideas, uh, I think is partly where I'm going here. Uh, how do we, how are we shaped by? I think that's also very important. Observing the ways in which uh, we are shaped imaginatively by these images that then lead us to then also construct maps that then help us to live those out.
as in the ways in which we've seen in some of these things, right? Knowing that, then I, I can also helps us to be critical, not only about maps we might inherit, but maps that we might construct. Thank you. Any other questions? We have one online question. Dad would like to come up and read a question. So this is from Joshua Topa, who says, does Dr. Young have any thoughts on how we train people to read the Christological map well for missiological purposes today? I have some thoughts. Um, in brief, they would be most simply understood by inviting you to read two other of my books. Uh, one would be Mission After Pentecost, and another would be the Missiological Spirit. And that would just be the beginning of the conversation, right? And so, um, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, any other questions at all from the floor? In which case, I think our time is actually up. So, well, thanks again, Dr. Amos Young, for your wonderful lecture this evening. <laughs> Well, for those who wish to continue the conversation, we have coffee and tea ready at a cafe. So please just proceed to the cafe and continue the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>